following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. After receiving all of the previous sacraments related with baptism and penance, etc., the initiate who is aspiring towards the path of the Bodhisattva passes through the sacrament of confirmation, which we discussed in the previous lecture. And that sacrament relates to the period of life of adolescence, the time of puberty, when the body is passing through the process of its development towards its completion, which is, as you remember from the previous lecture, between the ages of 18 and 21, depending on whether The organism is male or female. All the previous sacraments are preparations. They are a period of learning, stages through which the soul must learn and be educated in order to be prepared for the sacrament of matrimony. The sacrament of matrimony like all of the sacraments, is sacred. And of course, you can see the relationship between sacrament and sacred. And this is why in all of the ancient religions and mystical traditions of humanity, matrimony or marriage has always been considered a religious act, a sacred act. That's why marriage has always been in the domain of the priesthood, not the government. Until recent times, of course, when marriage has become an economic factor. When we talk about the sacraments, what we're really discussing are sacred initiations or levels of instruction that the soul passes through. And these sacraments have been instituted by the Gnostic Church, which has its primary domain in the realm of da'at, knowledge, which is that realm where the father-mother unite in order to create. This is the level of the yabyum, the father, mother, the Elohim. And from their sacred union, all creation is realized. The sacrament or sacred act of matrimony is a reflection of that union between the divine father and divine mother, Shiva, Shakti, Abba, and Ima. That union, that act in that 
is an act of sacrifice. It's an act of love. The sphere of that is synonymous with love. It is here where the God and goddess unite because of their profound love. And that union, its very substance is love. And its result is love. The child, the son, Osiris, or Christ, is the very embodiment of the love of father-mother, yad Yum. So that son, that love, is Christ, the Savior, the sacred force of pure, cognizant bodhicitta, love. And this is a form of love that's beyond the seven spheres below that. It is beyond the spirit, the consciousness, the will, the mind, the emotion, beyond energy, beyond anything physical. This is a form of love that is incomprehensible to our mind, but is knowable through our heart. This is why the sacrament of matrimony is so sacred. Sacrament is also related with sacrifice. And the word sacrifice is derived from the word sacrament. The word sacrifice means to perform a priestly act. Priestly. In accordance with the order of Melchizedek, which is the priesthood of Da'at, or the Gnostic Church, in Da'at. Therefore, matrimony is an act of sacrifice from love. And this is the purpose and reason for us to have matrimony, is to realize, to experience, to develop the capacity for pure, sacrificing love. The love that's so strong that we can sacrifice our very life for the one we love. To sacrifice our blood. To sacrifice anything for the one we love. <clears throat> In the Zohar, which is an ancient document related to Kabbalah, we read, this quote. Truly, the subject of marriage must be of the greatest anxiety to the Holy One. Blessed is the lot of Israel who enjoys the secret doctrine that teaches them his holy way, as also the secrets and mysteries attending them. It is written, the law of the Lord is perfect converting the soul. Blessed is he who studies in it, marriage, and rules his life thereby. For then he acquires length of days and learns the secret of life. All of this is embodied in the sacrament of matrimony. And later in the Zohar it also says, If it be asked, when does the Holy Spirit or divine life manifest itself in a man? It is when the union we have just mentioned is effected. It is the true, the divine marriage when they twain become one flesh. So marriage in Kabbalah, like every religion, like every tradition, is that sacrifice or sacrament wherein the two twain, male and female, join to become one flesh and thereby realize the nature of divine love. Marriage is sacred. All of the great prophets and masters and Buddhas and avatars practiced the sacrament of matrimony. The sacrament of matrimony is unavoidable for the one who wants to reach the heights of realization because it is through matrimony, the union of male and female, that the soul learns how to be like God, to create in the image of God, Da'at, the Elohim, the Father-Mother. 
And through that replication of the activities of God, the couple learns how to create pure love of Christ through that union. However, the sacrament of matrimony is a stage on the journey. It is a stage that one must be prepared to enter. And having entered, one performs it until one perfects it. And then the soul has the option to no longer be married. This is why we find some great masters and avatars and teachers who are not married. Either they have not entered the sacrament or they have completed it. The greatest ones obviously completed the sacrament. We need to understand this clearly because there are many religions who nowadays have the mistaken belief that you can reach the heights of realization without the union of husband and wife. And this is a mistaken idea. God created sex. God creates through sex. And for the soul to learn to create according to divine law, the soul must learn how to create through sex. As Jesus stated in the gospel, to be born again. Not to be born of flesh, but of spirit. And as you know, anything in life that is born, is born through sex. The soul is no exception. We know, of course, in the Christian tradition that Paul, for example, recommends the path of brahmacharya, or to be single. But what people don't grasp is that the state that Paul had reached was anterior or after matrimony. He had already passed through that sacrament. Peter, on the other hand, who was the first pope, the rock of the church, was married and had a wife. We need to understand this. The word matrimony reveals to us the secret of the sacrament related to marriage. This is why we call it the perfect matrimony. Because in the word matrimony are terrible, tremendous, powerful clues for us to comprehend and understand. The first part of the word matrimony is, of course, M-A-T-R, which comes from mater in Latin, which means mother. Ma, which is where we get aima, mother. Ma, Amma, Minerva, Maria, Mary, Mira, Maya, Mara. All of these terms are derived from the same root. And the M is represented in that dashed or a triangulated line related to Aquarius, which represents the water. Ma, or the M, Mem from Hebrew, represents the water. So there's always a close relationship between the Divine Mother and the womb or prakriti of nature. The second part of matrimony is monium from Latin, which means action, state, or condition. When we put those two things together, we can understand that the word matrimony means the action, the state, the condition of the Divine Mother. This is a very profound thing. What it implies, what it means, is that the marriage of husband and wife is the state or condition through which the Divine Mother can act. And we know this is true in all the occult traditions because it is through Tantra, the union of male-female, that the Kundalini is realized, is awakened. And Kundalini is the Divine Mother herself. It's through the union of male and female that the forces of the Divine Mother can descend and act in the world. 
We also see this reflected in the Zohar. In the Zohar it says, the verse, and Isaac brought her, his wife, into his mother Sarah's tent. Our masters have interpreted to mean that the divine presence came into Isaac's house along with Rebekah, his wife. According to the secret doctrine, the supernal mother is together with the male only when the house is in readiness and at the time the male and female are conjoined. At such time, blessings are showered forth by the supernal mother upon them. So even the Zohar states, the blessings of the mother are only delivered when the couple is in sexual union. This is a very profound statement. And he says directly that this is the secret doctrine. This is Da'at. The wisdom and knowledge of Da'at is through the sexual union of male and female. This is when the blessings of the Divine Mother Kundalini can be showered upon the couple. We find the same symbol hidden in the Christian Gospels. So I'll read to you now Uh, from the Gospel of John, chapter 2. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have drunk well, than that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. So this story tells the first miracle that Jesus performs during his ministry, during his life. The first miracle of Jesus was to transform water into wine at a marriage. This has tremendous significance. As the very first miracle, it is the indication or implication of the very purpose and point of the Christian doctrine. It is the very first act of Christ, and thus we need to understand it. This is why this sacrament, this action, is so important in the Gnostic Church. So to understand this story, we'll go through it in detail so we can fully comprehend what the story symbolizes. It begins, And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. The mother of Jesus is the Virgin Mary. Mary, or Miriam, was a virgin when she gave birth to her son, Jesus. Mary, or Miriam, Aima, symbolizes the Divine Mother of Bina, who, with union with her spouse, the Holy Spirit, creates through Da'at. Miriam, or Mary, symbolizes the Divine Mother of every religion, who is always a virgin and who always has a son, because she has her pregnancy, the conception and pregnancy and childbirth in Da'at, 
which is the knowledge of the secret doctrine. Thus, she is a virgin, but still manages to give birth. This is the sacred nature of Tantra. Jesus is called to the marriage. And Jesus represents Yeshua, the Savior, the Son of the Divine Mother. Jesus represents Tiferet on the Tree of Life, which is the sixth sphere. Tiferet represents our consciousness, our human soul, but also the priest. Jesus in this story is the priest of the marriage. He is the one who is overseeing the marriage. When the priest is before the altar of God, the priest is always acting as an as a mediator between Christ and the congregation. Between father mother in that and the church. The priest is Tiferet. And Tiferet is the sixth sphere, as I mentioned. And the letter in Hebrew alphabet in the sixth position is Vav. The letter Vav is shaped like a staff or a rod. It's a tall pole with a yod at the top. This is the letter of Tiferet. This is why every priest carries a staff. When a priest is at the altar and he's officiating over a ritual, he always has a staff in his hand. That staff is Vav, Tiferet. But that staff represents the spinal column. The reason is the spinal column, like Tiferet, is the center of the tree, the center column, the very point of balance upon which the tree is hinged. And it's through the spine that the Kundalini raise, raises itself, which is the force of the Divine Mother. And it's through the spine that we receive, transform, and transmit all of the energies of the three amens, which descend into our three brains, into our three nervous systems, and are transmitted out. So that great center of all of our energies is the spinal column. It is the central structure of our body, and it is the central structure of our soul. This is why the staff in the hand of the priest is so important. So the priest is, represents Tiferet, related with the spine, who receives the forces of Christ through the spine, through the kundalini, and is able to transmit that force for the benefit of the congregation in the, in the way that every ritual is conducted. The mantra of Tiferet, the sacred word of Tiferet, is Eloa va dat yod he vav he. This is a Hebrew phrase. Eloa is Hebrew for goddess, for the divine mother. It's another word for Aima. Eloa is the divine mother in that Mary or Miriam, Ama. Va means and. Da'at is knowledge. And dyot he vav he is Jehovah and Da'at, or the Holy Spirit. So the mantra, the sacred phrase of Tiferet, says, Goddess and knowledge, Father in, in Da'at. This is the, how important the relationship is between our human soul, our inner priest, and our own inner divine mother and father. And that relationship hinges upon the spine. The spine, the staff that the priest holds in his hand. When we look a little deeper into that mantra, the second part is yod he vav he. This is the four-letter name of God. And these four letters we've talked about pretty extensively. The yod represents the man. The he represents the woman. The vav represents the spine, but also the phallus. And the he again represents the womb or the uterus. So we see in the very name of Yehovah, 
Jehovah, man, woman, sexual union, hidden in the name of God. Tiferet, when fully developed and fully incarnating the nature of that mantra, Eloah va'adat yoteh v'apheh, when Tiferet has fully encompassed that and embodied that, this is what we call a bodhisattva. Because that mantra embodies all the forces of Da'at, which is the creative power of God, through the Elohim, El plus Eloa, father, mother. That creative power results in that pure love of sacrifice, bodhicitta. So when the human soul, our soul, has fully embodied that and incarnated that, and develop that, that soul is a fully developed bodhisattva or a vehicle of wisdom, a vessel of Christ, an embodiment of pure love. And that love always expresses itself through great acts of sacrifice. This is the nature of bodhicitta, to sacrifice for others, to do the best for the other, This is also why we know that the bodhisattvas always act as the mediator or intermediary between the divine forces and those who suffer, the congregation. This is the priest, the bodhisattva, who performs the sacraments or rituals in order to bring the forces of Christ, Chinrezi, down in order to aid those who are still in suffering. So we'll continue with this story from the book of John. The story says, and when they wanted wine, who are they? Who wants wine? Obviously, in this case, we would say the candidates who want to enter the sacrament of marriage. The couple who is seeking to become married want wine. They want that wine that results from the transmutation, the transformation of the sexual waters into purified wine or the ecstasies of the soul. A couple who's seeking to marry is a couple who is in love, intoxicated through their love and want that wine that intoxicates the soul. So the story says, and when they, the candidates for matrimony, wanted wine, the mother, Aima, of Jesus, saith unto him, the priest, they, the new couple, have no wine. Which means that the couple has not entered yet into the sacrament of matrimony, thus they have not awakened the kundalini. They have not transformed their own water into wine, but they need to. Now, why is she telling him that? Why is the Divine Mother telling the priest? It's because there is that relationship between Tiferet and the Divine Mother. It is the job of Tiferet, the priest, to aid the couple, to instruct them in the sacrament of matrimony. And that's why the priest always oversees that sacrament and gives his guidance to the couple. This is why in the next line, his mother says to the couple to obey the priest. We'll get to that in a moment. When she says this, they have no wine. Jesus, who represents the priest, says, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. This is because the couple is not yet married. The priest cannot fully instruct them and give them the instructions of sacrament until the marriage is complete, until they are married. Then the hour has come for them to receive the instruction. So she tells him that they need the wine. And then she turns to them. In the Bible it says, His mother saith unto the servants. 
Now, the servants are the couple, again, because the servants want to serve Christ, to serve the mother, to serve God, to serve others through their endeavor to realize the nature of true love, or bodhicitta. So his mother saith unto the servants, the couple, whatsoever he, the priest, saith unto you, do it. In other words, when we are entering a marriage inspired by love and seeking to serve, we have to listen to the guidance of Tifereth. Tifereth is inside of us. Tifereth is our own human soul, our conscience, our own sense of what is right and wrong, our own intuition, which speaks to the heart. When fully developed, that force of Tifereth in us is our as how we become a bodhisattva because of our own inner Tifereth. So the story continues. And there were set six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, which is the baptism, the mikveh, the sacred bath, containing two or three firkins apiece. And that's just a measurement of quantity. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. The six water pots relates, of course, to the sixth sphere on the tree of life, which is Tiferet. But they also relate to the sixth arcanum, which is the arcanum of the lovers. And in that arcanum you see the human soul caught between the virgin and the whore, the divine mother and the fallen mother. And remember, the Hebrew letter of the sixth arcanum is Vav. There's a great deal of importance in this. Again, we see the human soul who's sunk into his own waters, which are murky. And he's between the virgin and the whore, having to decide who will he serve. So these six water pots that the couple has to fill with water are related with the sixth arcanum of indecision or the lovers. The water is the water of Yasad, the Mayim, the sexual waters that we have to transform into wine through the mediation of Tiferet. What we can see here is a great combination of deep symbols. We see the human soul in the midst between the virgin and the whore, related to the arcanum six, the vav, which relates to the spinal column. And in the story, the couple has to fill six water pots with water. Those water pots are also related with the spinal column. Through the spinal column flows the energy of the kundalini, which is derived from the water, from the sexual water. The spine itself in the center of the body, at the base of the spine, are the sexual organs, which is that water, where that water resides. And from that water emerges the fire of creation. And this is symbolized in the Vedas, the ancient books of Hinduism, when the gods and demons are pulling the great phallus back and forth by means of a serpent wrapped around this great rod. The rod sits in the ocean, the gods on one side, the demons on the other side, pulling the serpent back and forth and churning the ocean. And from that emerges all of the benefits and beauties of the soul. Here we see the same symbol in the Arcanum 6. The Divine Mother and the Demonic Mother fighting over the soul. And that soul is centered in his spinal column, the rod. What you might not have noticed is that the story that I'm reading to you about Jesus and his mother 
overseeing the wedding happened in a place called Cana. This is where we get our word Cain. Staff. The word Cana means reed, a bamboo reed. So the wedding happens in Cana of Galilee, and Galilee is a sea, is a body of water. So obviously this story is symbolic. The marriage happens in Cana, the place of the reeds, by the Sea of Galilee, the waters of Mem. So the story continues, and he, the priest, saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. Who is the governor of the feast? Our own inner Buddha. I said, our own spirit, who is the governor of our soul, the governor of our own wedding feast. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew. This represents how our own innermost does not know where that wine comes from because our own innermost is not the one who works in the hot. The couple, the servants, work in the hot, which is Tantra. They know where the wine comes from because they are the ones who did that work. But on a deeper level, this story also symbolizes the nature of the serpents of light, which come after the serpents of fire, these seven serpents of the lower seven spheres. Because in the serpents of light, the innermost does not raise those serpents. The Christ does. And that's what's represented in this story. Jesus, as Christ, performs that miracle. That's why the innermost does not know who did it. Why wine? Why is the Bible using the symbol of transforming the water into wine. Why is wine such a deep symbol in all these religious ceremonies? When we look at the Hebrew, we can understand why. The Hebrew word for wine is pronounced yayin. But this is only because of a general rule in the Hebrew language which is that any time a word begins with the letter Vav, it's actually pronounced and written with a Yod. So the word Yayin is actually Vain. Vine. Wine. And it's spelled Vav, Yod, Nun. Vain. Right there you have all the symbols in those three letters of why wine is used as a symbol. The vav, of course, represents the spinal column, the human soul, six tiferet. The yod is the man. And the nun is the salt of the earth, the combination of the three amens, which descend into the sexual waters. In the previous lectures, we talked about the three amens, which are aleph, shin, and mem, related to the three triangles on the tree of life. And these are air, fire, and water. And those three elements condense themselves when they flow into the physical body. And they become the nun, the letter nun, which symbolizes a fish. And it is that force of the three amens contained in the sexual waters, the force of the trinity, the three in one. So the word... Vayin, or Yayin, literally means that which is pressed out, that which is extracted. So the reason wine is used as a symbol is because it represents what we must extract from the combination of the Vav, the spine, the Yod, the man, and the Nun, the sexual seed. 
what we must extract, what we must transmute or transform. The wine also represents the intoxicating power of sex. We all know that. There is no more intoxicating power in existence. Sex is the most intoxicating force that exists. The question becomes, how do we utilize it? In the Zohar, it states that wine has two colors, white and red. And it says in the Zohar that the white wine is related with the right side. In this case, it would be related with Gebra, the divine soul. Kindness. I'm sorry, the right side is Hesed, mercy, love, our innermost, the governor of the feast. The red is related with the left side of Gebra, which is strength and judgment. What you might remember from previous lectures is that Gebra is related with Mars, with Samael. But these two colors of red and white wine are related with Ida and Pingala, Adam and Eve. When we transmute our own waters into wine, those forces, the transformed, purified wine, flow upwards in our body through two energetic channels which flow alongside the spinal column. They are called Od and Ob, Adam and Eve, Ida and Pingala. And these two forces are also in the Bible as the two candlesticks or the two olive trees. But these two forms of wine, white and red, are also represented in tantric physiology. When you study tantra from the east, you will study about the white drops and the red drops. These are forms of energy which exist inside of our subtle body. And the white drops are related with the masculine aspect. The red drops with the feminine aspect. And these are said to be the pure essence of the sexual fluids of male and female. These two drops are within all of us. But when we work with Tantra, we purify them, we awaken them, we enliven them, and they help to heal us. And it's said in Tantra that these drops, white and red, originate from one drop, the indestructible drop, the immortal drop which is in the heart, the Adam Noose. If you study Tantra, you can easily find information about these drops. But in Gnosis, we have different names for them. The indestructible drop, or immortal drop, we call the Noose Adam, which is a particle of Christ within our heart. That drop, that particle, is the exponent or the architect in relation with the human soul. And it's from that master architect, that master builder, the noose Adam, that we construct the soul and become a bodhisattva. Very deep significance here. That drop, the noose Adam, comes from Da'at, the union of father and mother. This is the son of the father and mother. When the drops, white and red, or the wine, in other words, are purified, they become vayin haya, living wine, purified wine. This purified wine is also symbolized in the Bible as oil, sacred oil. And you remember Jesus was anointed with oil before his death. And we have oil that flows through the lamps of the temple. The candlesticks are empowered 
or their flame is derived from oil. That oil represents the kundalini, the power of the Divine Mother. And in Tantra, that oil or that purified wine is called dumo, fierce woman, in other words. The power that the couple extracts by transforming the water into wine, into those two drops, yiga pingala, which in turn become kundalini, the oil, that is the power of the Divine Mother, Dumo. Kundalini, the fire of the Pentecost from the Gospel. That fire is the power to destroy illusion. The fire of Christ, the fire of the Divine Mother, which consumes that which is impure. Everyone knows about the intoxicating power of the orgasm, of the way sex is practiced commonly in couples. But what people don't realize is that that same intoxicating power, when it's harnessed and transformed, becomes the power of the Divine Mother, the Kundalini. And it becomes vastly more powerful and potent and intoxicating when the Divine Mother has it in her hands. This becomes the power of the gods. And in all the religious traditions, we see that sacred liquid symbolized as amrita, which is the elixir of immortality, or ambrosia, the food of the gods, or soma, the intoxicating drink that gives the gods their power. This is all symbolizing the same force. The tantrics in Tibet state that even though the orgasm feels powerful, when that energy is restrained, when it is held, when it is transformed by will, and will in the tree of life is Tiferet, our human soul, the priest, that intoxicating power is a hundred times more powerful than the normal orgasm. And that is the power that derives the bliss of the soul, the ecstasy of the consciousness, the awakening of the bodhicitta. In fact, bodhicitta in Tantra refers to the sexual energy. In the exoteric level, it's discussed as compassion and knowledge of prana or emptiness. But in Tantra, bodhicitta directly means the energy of sex, the bindu or tigle, That's why the commandment number six is thou shalt not fornicate. The sixth commandment is related with Tiferet. That commandment comes from Da'at. Thou shalt not fornicate because it concerns Tiferet in the center of the tree who must command the forces of Yasad in the center of the tree. The forces of Yasad are the sex, the lower waters of Eden. So all of this is elaborated under the guidance of Tiferet, our human soul, who symbolizes the priest. And he does all of this under the guidance of the Divine Mother, who is in Ba'at. It's beautiful to realize that this is a universal teaching. You remember in the story that the Virgin Mary called for the wine. She told Tiferet about this and commanded for the wine to be brought. Compare this with this ancient hymn that I'll read to you from the Tantric tradition. This is a hymn to Kali. It begins with three vowels, which relate to the three mother letters, Aleph, Shin, and Mem. Hring, O destroyer of time. Shring, O terrific one. Kring, thou who art all beneficent. Possessor of all the arts, thou art Kamala, which means lotus. Destroyer of pride of the Kali age, who art kind to him of the matted hair, that's Shiva, her husband. 
devourer of him who devours, which is time, mother of time, thou who art brilliant as the fires of the final dissolution, wife of him of the matted hair, O thou of formidable countenance, ocean of the nectar of compassion, bodhicitta, merciful, vessel of mercy, which is Hesed, our inner Buddha, whose mercy is without limit, who art attainable alone by thy mercy, who art fire, tawny, black of hue, thou who increasest the joy of the Lord of creation in Da'at, night of darkness, like the Egyptian Newt, image of desire, yet liberator from the bonds of desire, thou who art dark as a bank of clouds and bearest the crescent moon, destroyer of sin in the Kali age, thou who art pleased by the worship of virgins, thou who art the refuge of the worshipers of virgins, who art pleased by the feasting of the virgins, who art the image of the virgin. Thou who art youthful, who hast a soft, low voice, whose voice is sweet as the cry of a chakravaka bird, who drinkest and art pleased with the karambari wine, and whose cup is a skull, who wearest a garland of bones, who art pleased with and who art seated on the lotus, who abidest in the center of the lotus, whom the fragrance of the lotus pleases, who movest with the swaying gait of a swan, who art pleased with the nectar of purified wine, giver of success to those whom purified wine rejoices, the own deity of those who worship thee when joyed with wine, who art gladdened by the worship of thyself with purified wine, who art immersed in the ocean of purified wine, who art the protectress of those who accomplish ritual with wine. As you can see, in Tantra, they knew all of the mysteries of this sacrament when this hymn was written. This hymn could easily be written to any religious representation of the Divine Mother because her symbols are universal. She is black because she is the night the night sky filled with stars. She is Newt, which is Egyptian for night. The goddess Newt in the Egyptian mysteries stretches herself over creation and longs to join in union with her husband, Geb, who is the earth and is always represented with the phallus prepared to enter his wife. These two represent Shamayim and Mayim, they also represent Da'at, the union of the father-mother. The symbol of Newt is a ladder in the Egyptian mysteries. And the ladder was seen by Jacob when he laid his head upon the stone and had the vision of the ladder to and from heaven. That stone is the stone of sex, Yasod. That ladder is the spinal column which rises up to heaven, the Shamayim. That ladder is Vav, the spine. This hymn is written to the, to the goddess in Hinduism, Kalima. Sounds a lot like Aima from the Hebrew tradition. The important thing to know about Kali is like every Divine Mother, every representation of the Divine Mother, she has multiple aspects. In Gnosis, we study five aspects of the Divine Mother. Today, we're going to talk about two. Even though in our scripture that we read from the book of John, we see the Virgin Mary who oversees the ritual of the sacrament of matrimony and orders for the wine to be brought. We see in Hinduism a little more complete picture of the Divine Mother, of Aima, a little bit more of the duality of that force. Unfortunately, in Christianity, some of that duality has been masked or obscured. 
But it can also be seen in the Zohar, in Kabbalah, in the Egyptian mysteries, in, in uh, the Aztec mysteries, all the other traditions, the Greek. The Divine Mother Kalima or Aima represents our own inner Divine Mother. And she is symbolized here in this Arcanum 6 as having two fundamental aspects about which we need to learn. The positive aspect is the virgin. And you see in the story from Jesus and the wedding at Cana, his mother is a virgin. And we hear in this hymn that Kali is a virgin. So in the Arcanum 6, the virgin is here on the left side of the card, but to the right of the initiate. This is the right-hand path, the path of purity, of chastity, of truth, the path that follows the pure Divine Mother, the path of the sixth commandment, thou shalt not fornicate. When we follow the teachings of the secret doctrine, of Tantra, of Daat, we learn how to extract the yayin, the wine, to press out the purified wine, the purified sexual energy, and intoxicate the soul with the essence of the Divine Mother. But we can also learn, and unfortunately we all learn, how to press out fermented wine, rotted wine. You know that when you ferment something, you really rot it. It turns rotten. It becomes impure. And it intoxicates the senses. Through sex, we can create pure wine, unfermented wine, or we can produce fermented wine, alcoholic wine, intoxicating wine, that deludes the soul, that blinds the senses. In other words, sex can create or it can destroy. When we follow the sacraments, when we follow the commandments, the wine is good and creates in harmony with the law. And that's why our story continues from the book of John. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have drunk well, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. In other words, our being, our innermost, enjoys the wine that comes from respecting the commandments, the sacraments. That wine feeds him. That is the amrita, the ambrosia, that gives life to the gods, our own inner god, chesed, our inner Buddha. This is the wine that gives the immortality to all the gods. And what he says here, in other words, is that the real man, the man of the sixth day of Genesis, who already has incarnated his Geburah and Hesed, always gives forth good wine from the beginning because he has not fallen into sin. In other words, his use of sex is pure. His use of that energy is pure. And what he presses out from his vav, from his spine, and his sex, is purified wine, which nourishes the gods. But unfortunately, in our story, this bridegroom was fallen and from the beginning did not give forth good wine, but that which is worse. In other words, the bridegroom was fallen into fornication and disgrace, just like all of us. But through the intercession of Christ, Tiferet, the human soul, the bridegroom has entered the sacrament of matrimony and learned how to make purified wine, which delights the innermost. Then the story concludes, Thus, this beginning of miracles did Jesus, Tiferet, in Cana, the spinal column, of Galilee, the waters of sex, and manifested manifested forth his glory, Hod. And his disciples, the married couple, believed on him. In other words, they followed the path of Christ, the Bodhisattva, the Bodhicitta. 
This is what we need to do to learn how to practice the sacrament of matrimony, to follow the commandments. To do that, we need to understand the duality of the forces that are involved. So now I'll read you another excerpt from the Zohar. This excerpt represents the opposite aspect, the fallen aspect of the Divine Mother and her spouse. So listen closely. There's a lot of deep meaning in this passage from the Zohar. It begins, The secret of secrets from the strength of the noon flame of Isaac, from the wine lees, the wine press, a naked plant came forth, comprising together male and female, red like a lily, and they spread out on several sides down several paths. The male is called Samael, and his female is always included with him. Just as on the side of holiness there are male and female, so on the other side there are male and female, included one with the other. The female of Samael is called snake, a wife of harlotry, the end of all flesh, the end of days. Two evil spirits are attached to one another. The male spirit is subtle. The female spirit spreads out down several ways and paths and is attached to the male spirit. So I'm going to pause here so we can discuss this. This says the secret of secrets, which is a reference to Da'at, the secret knowledge of sex, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, good and bad. That tree is the knowledge of how sex can be used in the positive way or the negative way, in the upright way or the devolving way. And what the Zohar clearly states is that just as on the side of holiness there are male and female, so on the other side there are male and female. This other side is being described here as Samael and his wife. Samael in the inverted way. But Samael also has his positive aspect. And as we studied in other lectures, Samael is the regent of Mars, an archangel related with Geberah and Tiferet. Geberah is the sphere of strength, justice. Samael is the archangel of strength, the ruler of justice who enacts the law. So in the positive aspect, Samael is the regent of Mars, the force of war against the ego, the arm of karma, the sword of karma. And he has his wife. But in the negative aspect, Samael is also there. And as we studied, Samael is the one who provides the sexual fire, who works through the sex to give us sexual strength. But that strength can be misused, which inverts the power of Samael. And that's why Samael is called the tempter and is identified with the serpent. Again, the serpent is dual. The serpent can rise, the serpent can fall. So in this story, we're studying how Samael and his spouse, who is Kalima, her inverted aspect, Lilith Nahima, these fallen aspects of the Divine Mother. So let's continue this quote. She dresses herself in finery like an abominable harlot and stands at the corners of streets and highways in order to attract men. When a fool approaches her, she embraces him and kisses him and mixes her wine lees, the extracted wine, which is the intoxicating sexual power, with the poison of a snake for him. And that poison, obviously, is lust. Once he has drunk, he turns aside after her. And here we see our canon six in the Zohar. The man who's intoxicated by lust because of the power of Lilith and Nahima turns to the whore to worship her. So the story continues. 
when she sees that he has turned aside after her from the way of truth, the virgin mother, she takes off all the finery that she had put on for the sake of this fool. In other words, as soon as we become intoxicated through our lust and we fall from the way of truth, then we can see the harlot for what she is. Then we see lust for what it is. Then we see our foolishness. This is the finery that she uses to seduce mankind. Her hair is long, red like a lily. Her face is white and pink. Six pendants hang at her ears. Her bed is made of Egyptian flax, and all the ornaments of the east encircle her neck. Her mouth is shaped like a tiny door, beautified with cosmetic. Her tongue is sharp like a sword. Her words smooth as oil. Her lips beautiful, red as a lily, sweetened with all the sweetnesses in the world. She is dressed in purple and attired in 39 items of finery. This fool turns aside after her and drinks from the cup of wine and commits harlotry with her, completely enamored of her. What does she do? She leaves him asleep on the bed and ascends to the realms above, accuses him before the law, obtains authority from the divine, and descends. The fool wakes up thinking to sport with her as before, but she takes off her finery and turns into a fierce warrior. Geborah, Samael. Facing him in a garment of flaming fire, a vision of dread, terrifying both body and soul, full of horrific eyes, a sharpened sword in his hand, with drops of poison suspended and dripping from it. He kills the fool and throws him into Gehenom. Klippot. Very deep, very clear story that explains how when we become intoxicated by Lilith and Nahema, by the, vir- by the whore who opposes the virgin, what arrives for us but karma, the sword of Samael, drips with poison. The name Samael literally means the bitter beverage or the poison of God. That's what Samael means. Samael is the one who can rise us to the heavenly realms or if we fornicate with the whore, he is the one who casts us into hell. This is why the master Samael on the Or, who is the Bodhisattva of the Archangel Samael, said very clearly, stay back profaners and curious ones because the doctrine of Gnosis will make you an angel or a demon. There are no other outcomes. And this is because he understands the nature of his inner being, Samael, the Archangel. Through the power of sex, we create the soul, or we create the demon in us. So this story tells us a lot of important things that we need to comprehend in our own mind, in our own psyche. That Samael has a dual aspect. The Divine Mother has a dual aspect. And it's up to us. The Arcanum 6 shows our soul having to choose between the virgin and the whore. This is not a decision we make just upon hearing of this teaching and saying, from now on, I'm going to follow the virgin. This is a good intention, but the path is not walked from a decision like that. The Arcanum 6 happens every day. We make this decision continually from moment to moment. When we're confronted with the impressions of life, with the surging impressions that come out of our own mind. We have to choose from moment to moment who do we serve, the virgin or the whore. 
This story also represents for us why people suffer so much in life. People in these times have made marriage into prostitution. Marriage has lost its sacred nature. Marriage has become a bed of fornication with no difference between how the so-called humans perform sex and the animals. The humans, so-called, perform sex even worse than the animals do. Like prostitutes, like pigs. And because of that, they suffer. Because they become enamored of the whore with all her finery and her beauties, and they lay with her and cohabit with her in their psychology. The result is, after a short period of that enjoyment or sport, they then begin to see the truth of it, that their spouse or their partner is actually offensive, that there is no love there, there's only lust. And then the suffering comes, and then hell enters into that relationship. That relationship becomes a source of incredible suffering. That's why divorce is so common. That's why adultery is so common. That's why pornography is infecting all of the minds of people in these times. The pain and suffering of humanity is due to this. This is the cause. It can all be traced back to the abuse of sex. So, we need to learn the sacrament of matrimony. To learn how through the alchemy that transforms the wine, transforms the water into wine, we develop that nun, the letter nun, in the sex, which is the embodiment of those three amens, the force of Christ. And through that transformation, we can develop the soul. If we squander the sexual force, if we fornicate, if we commit adultery, if we abuse of the commandments, if we lay with the whore in our mind, we cannot develop the power of the three amens. The power of Christ cannot mix with the power of the devil. We cannot sit at two tables at one time. We have to choose. We have to make our marriage, our sexual life, pure. We have to make it a sacrament, a sacrifice, a force of Christic love, pure love. We have to make our marriage an altar and to perform the sexual act as if in the presence of God because we are. When man and woman join in the sexual act, they unite all of the forces of their body, soul, and spirit. And they become one flesh, not two. That one flesh includes God. And that union is the presence of the Divine Mother. This is the house of the Divine Mother. Beth. Sex. The marriage happens, sexual union happens in her home. And we need to respect that. This is why the Bible says marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. How do we defile the bed? Through the orgasm. This is what it states in the book of Leviticus 16 that the orgasm, the excretion, the expelling of the sexual energy is an offense. It is filthy. It is impure. It is unnecessary. It is the doctrine of Lilith and Nahima. What we need then is to make the sacrament of matrimony in our life in order to be born again. To create the soul requires sex. To be born again requires sex. We need scientific chastity. We need to be made into the image of God, the image of Da'at, father and mother.
The sexual union of man and wife is instituted through matrimony for a reason. This sacrament is so important for a reason. The initiate has to pass through all the previous sacraments in order to be prepared for marriage. This is not something one just does on a whim or because it sounds good or because we are impassioned for another person. The sacrament of matrimony is a sacred duty, a sacred ritual. It's very, very important to enter into that matrimony consciously and because of love, not ambition. To be made into the image of God means to work within the forces of God to respect the laws. God created the heaven and the earth as Elohim. Elohim is a combination of El and Eloa, God and Goddess. The Elohim create God and Goddess in union, in Da'at. This is why in the beginning the Bible says, let us make man in our image. God is not a man. God is male, female. And thus, for us to enter, to create ourselves, to become the image of God, we do this through male, female. Returning to Eden. Returning to sex, but in the pure way. When the sexes were divided, it was so that humanity could learn this. When man and female, male and female were divided into separate bodies, it was so they could join once more in order to learn the mystery of Da'at, the union of father and mother, so that they could learn the power of love. Male and female join in the sacrament of matrimony to learn how to love. to embody the power of Christ. To incarnate Christ. Thus, here in this physical world, we seek a partner. When we pass through the early sacraments, up through the sacrament of confirmation, we pass through puberty, and then we enter our youth, which begins at 21 for the man, 18 for the woman. It is at this stage that we are prepared for marriage, for our own matrimony. Then we begin to look for our spouse. This is where the Arcanum 6 becomes especially important. Throughout puberty, we deal with this Arcanum 6 of choosing between the virgin and the whore very much every day fighting to control the sexual desires that are rampant in the body between the ages of 13 and 14 and 21. This is a very big struggle. But this struggle is only preparation for the struggle to enter into matrimony. Because this is also a battle. It is a battle of the human soul, Tiferet, in us to define himself, to choose between the virgin and the whore, in the mind, in the heart, in the sex. Thus, at that age, we meet many people, we interact with many people, and we have many pressures upon us to get married. Nowadays, it's not as strong, this push for marriage. Nowadays, it's a push just to have sex. And usually that's from our friends. We need to fight that and remain true to our own inner Divine Mother and remain true to our ordained spouse. This is because our spouse is chosen for us by God, not by anyone else. We, in this time of life, 21 on, 
need to enter the sacrament of matrimony in order to develop the soul, in order to walk the path. And we feel that pressure. And many people read the books and study the doctrine and feel that pressure. I have to get married now, otherwise I won't get anything. And so they have a lot of ambition, a lot of drive to just find a spouse, anyone. And they actively seek through any way they can some person that they feel even the slightest affinity for. This is a very difficult battle. Very difficult. A very strong ordeal. But you remember, Lilith uses all her charms, dresses in all her finery, looks beautiful, has words of sweetness on her lips, may even speak about chastity and the doctrine of Samael because she is his wife but inverted. Students of this doctrine need to exercise great caution. Your being knows you need a spouse. Your being will bring you a spouse when you are prepared, but you have to earn it. There are no exceptions to this. The only one who can know who your spouse is is your inner tiferet, your human soul, your consciousness. If you are identified with your own inner lilith, your own inner nahima, then you're not listening to your human soul, your inner priest. This is why people become confused. They marry for convenience. They marry for money. They marry because their instructor told them to. They marry because the tarot cards told them to. They marry because it seems like a good idea, because Gnosis says we're supposed to get married, etc. Many justifications, many reasons, but no love. Love is an undeniable force, unmistakable. If you're a single person and you're facing the choice of potential marriage, of a prospective marriage, wait until the force of love is undeniably clear to you, irresistible, where you cannot control your love. But it is a pure love, the love of sacrifice, a love so strong, so emotional, that you would die for the one you love. You would give up anything. You would not ask for anything in return. Then you know you have found the one. Before that, it's all mind games. Trickery. Possibilities. Illusions. Doubts. Opinions. Reasoning. Justifications. Possibilities. But no certainty. If you're facing that, wait. Don't get advice. Don't get opinions. Meditate. Listen to your own tiferet. If you're already married and you're suffering and you have doubt and you have pain, wait. As the Bible says, as Paul said, Let every man take what God has given to him. We have to fight ourselves. The guidance that we receive in all these ordeals comes through Tiferet, comes through Nus, the Adam in the heart which is the indestructible drop of Tantra. Nous is the atom of Christ, which can guide us through intuition. And Nous is the force that can bring us that feeling of love, pure love, undeniable love, but in the heart. We need to listen to that. The goal is to arrive at the perfect matrimony, The perfect matrimony 
is a union of man and woman on all the seven levels of the body, soul, and spirit. This is a union and compatibility in the physical world related to Malkut. This is a union and compatibility in Yasod, our energies, especially sexual. This is a union and compatibility in Hod, the third sphere related to the astral plane. And this is emotional. Also in the fourth sphere, Natsa, in the mind, a union and compatibility, a sympathy for one another in the intellect. Fifth, in Tiferet, a union of will, of having like will, compatible will. Sixth, in the consciousness. And seventh, in the spirit. When the two who enter into matrimony have this level of compatibility, they can manifest perfect love, love of Christ, that love that comes from Christ and expresses Christ. This is the goal. We don't start there. We start where we are. We start here, slaves of Lilith and Nahima, infected with lust, with egos of prostitution and adultery and fornication, and all kinds of filthiness. We start here and we start now, defining ourselves, fighting against those aspects. And if we have a spouse, we work together to change this situation. We face our inner conflicts and we transform ourselves every day from moment to moment. This is the six water pots that Jesus commands the couple to fill with water. The six water pots related to the Arcanum Six. We have to fill those water pots with purified water, which then the priest, the Christ, can make into wine. This is a very subtle thing to realize in your own relationship, to know how to transform the sexual energy continually, daily, constantly, in every way, in every interaction with your spouse, no matter what happens, to transform and to reply with conscious love, not with anger, not with pride, not with lust. Conscious love. Sacrifice. When the spouse comes to you and is angry and is upset, you have to learn to reply with patience with understanding, with sacrifice. To give to the other because you love them and you see them suffering and you want to give to them to help them. This is something that the intellect can never do. This is something that spiritual ambition can never do. A marriage of convenience cannot accomplish it. It's built on the wrong foundation. The marriage that's becoming the perfect matrimony is a marriage that embodies the force of sacrifice. And we learn that first with our spouse. And that sacrifice is beautiful. It is the most beautiful thing you can imagine. Tiferet means beauty. That sacrifice is conscious. It is beautiful. It is love. And there is no I there. No me. Through the perfect, through the matrimony, the sacrament of matrimony, we learn how to sacrifice selflessly. And we learn that first with our spouse. The marriage is intensely psychological. It's here that we learn the most about our mind. And we have the most opportunity to transform. But it is also the biggest challenge. It is the hardest work. This is why we have to prepare ourselves through all the previous sacraments. It takes a lot of work to be ready for a marriage. 
And it takes a lot of work to be successful in one. Very, very difficult. Some Gnostics study this doctrine and have the idea that as soon as they're married, they're on the express train to God. In some way, it's true. But it's not a smooth ride. It's terrifying. It is terrifying. It is up and down and back and forth, into the abyss and out of the abyss, through great periods of darkness, through challenges, through incredible storms. Because we have all of that in our mind. And our matrimony takes us through it. The matrimony is our chance to change. This is why the sexual union, the matrimony, is so sacred. It's treated with so much respect in traditional religious setting. We need to re- recall that, remember that, and embody that. To treat our marriage as something very holy, because it is. To enter into marriage as something holy and sacred. Not to enter in because of ambition or curiosity or to satisfy someone else. You might be engaged or involved with someone now who wants to get married. And you might say, well, maybe I should because we're already involved. You need to be very clear with yourself. To enter into marriage is a commitment for eternity. Not for just now. When the Bible says they become one flesh, it's because they do. The union that occurs sexually begins in Mount Cook. But that union is energetic, it is emotional, it is mental, it is in will, consciousness, and spirit. All the seven levels that we described. The seven levels of the male join and unite with the seven levels of the female and they become one. It's a law of physics that when any two bodies come in close contact, they don't even have to touch, but come close to each other, there is always an exchange of particles. The two cross just by coming close to each other. In the sexual union, there is a very powerful crossing And, of course, the cross symbolizes that. We cross ourselves with our spouse in all of these seven levels, and we exchange forces and energies, and we become one. This is a permanent bond. It cannot be dissolved. There will always be a connection. There will always be a marriage between those two souls. There will always be a bond. This is how serious matrimony is. In this time, we think it's a game. We think sex is a game. That it's just for fun. That you can go out and have sex with as many people as you want and it's just for fun. This is Lilith. This is how Lilith has deceived humanity. And this is how she draws them into her bed. She lays with them. And then while they sleep consciously, she goes and gets her husband, Samael, who comes to deliver the karma with his sword. And it is painful. If we learn to respect the sacrament of matrimony, we choose the virgin. We align ourselves with that inner truth, with our own inner divine mother, and she guides us. And as we perform the sacrament of matrimony and we fight against our own inner relief, our own inner psychology, our own lust, gradually 
we pass through all the initiations related to these seven levels. And in each level, we raise the forces of the Divine Mother up the spinal column, Vav, the staff. And with each level, the Divine Mother is more and more present in us. That power to raise the Kundalini only happens in a marriage, a perfect matrimony, or a matrimony that is aspiring towards perfection, a matrimony that is in scientific chastity, respecting the commandment of Tiveret, thou shalt not fornicate. In doing so, the power of the Kundalini raises through each of these bodies. We are born again. We create the soul. The Divine Mother comes to inhabit our soul. That purified wine inflames our consciousness and intoxicates our soul. In this way, we develop power. In the book of Acts, the apostles receive the Pentecostal fire that shows above their heads. In the books of Moses, Moses carries his staff, which he transforms into a serpent and works miracles. The staff is the spine. The fire is the Holy Spirit. The fire of the Divine Mother. Bina, who separates and divides, enters into union and that, and delivers this power unto their disciples. This is the power of the priesthood. When the matrimony is following the sacraments and commandments, is raising this power, this fire of the Divine Mother through these seven levels, the human soul, Tiferet, is receiving the power of the priesthood. This is why a priest must be married. There is no other way for a priest to call upon the forces of Christ. The spinal column is the vehicle, the means, the human soul working with the spine, Vav, in the center of the tree, calls upon the forces of Christ, which come through Tiferet on behalf of the congregation. Do you have any questions? into the warrior. warrior. How is it that she's allowed to enter into the superior spheres? In the same way that... Deliver judgment. Uh, that's a good question. In the same way that Lucifer does. Remember in the book of Job that Lucifer goes to the courts of God and asks permission to tempt Job. Right? To tempt Job. To prove Job's value. Lucifer is that sexual power. And Lucifer symbolizes the power of Samael, the sexual power of the serpent, which can be positive or negative, right? In the story, Lilith is that same power, just inverted. But she's connected with the divine aspect as well. This is beautifully represented in Hinduism. The divine mother, Kalima, is dual. She's the consumer of time, but also the mother of time. She can walk through all the worlds. And what that symbolizes is that our own Divine Mother gives birth to us, right? But she can also consume us. She can give us birth in the superior worlds, or she can consume us in the inferior worlds. You have to remember that all of existence emerges from the womb of the Divine Mother. It's all because of her. And she has many aspects and faces which the intellect will struggle to grasp. When you encounter the Divine Mother Death, for example, she's terrifying, but she's our own mother. When you encounter the Divine Mother as Kali in the inverted way or as Lilith, she's the temptress. She's there to teach us. But if we become enslaved, hypnotized by that force, she will 
call upon the forces of Geburah, karmic law, to push us through Klippot. In other words, the Divine Mother will save us one way or the other because she loves her children. She can save us if we want the positive way, if we do the work ourselves and destroy our own ego. If we don't do that, she'll destroy us the inverted way through Klippot. Either way, she loves us. Is that related with that statement of revelation that says about the whore and the things that are reached even unto heaven? Right. Yeah, in the book of Revelation it says the sins of Babylon or Jezebel, was it? Babylon. Yeah, the sins of Babylon have reached even unto heaven. And this is related to that. We have to remember that Klippoth was instituted and put in place by God. The forces that rule Klippoth are divine. Pluto, right? Persephone, um, Proserpine, his wife. These forces rule Klippoth. Samael has dominion in Klippoth. So the choice is ours. This is what our Canon 6 represents. The choice is ours. We can continue to fornicate. We can continue on the path of filthiness. And eventually... We will come out the other side, but having gained nothing but suffering. Is that why some people think evil is good? Exactly. This is why the path of evil is so widely taught and embraced. Because they're taught that eventually they will reach heaven. And it's true. Eventually all souls will return. But there's a difference between them, and that's what the demons don't teach. The demons and the disciples of Lilith teach that through fornication you acquire powers, which you do. They teach that once you've become completely condensed as an I, as an ego, through the teachings of Black Tantra, that you will be propelled out the other side of the Klippoth. And the other side of the Klippoth is the Absolute. The same as at the top of the Tree of Life. But they're mistaken. What happens when they pass through that path of Black Tantra is that they encounter millions of years of suffering for that ego to be dissolved by the forces of Divine Mother Death, Kali. And when they exit that process of suffering, they're back where they started, having nothing. No development as a soul. This is the secret that they neglect to teach. Another question back here? When I warned about lying with the whore in the mind, I'm referring to the teaching that Jesus gave when he said, Yea, ye have heard of old that ye shall not commit adultery. But even when you look at a woman with lust, you have already committed adultery with her in your heart. That's the meaning. We lie with Lilith in our mind through fantasy. Yeah, and in that process, we create incubi and succubi, which are Lilith and Ashmodai, the male and female demonic forces that feed themselves from our sexual water, from the wine that is impure. More questions? Yeah. Yeah, in uh, Samuel and Zora's book, The Perfect Matrimony, uh, it talks about the sphere of Lilith and the sphere of Nahima. Mm -hmm. Haven't uh, yet fully comprehended these two spheres? Where are these two spheres? And like, how are they active? In which way? In the previous lecture, this was discussed at length. So you can refer back to the lecture on confirmation. But in general, the spheres of the Klippoth are two great realms belonging to Lilith and Nahima. These are psychological spheres, not physical or material so much. The realms of the psyche. So there are aspects of our psychology that belong to the sphere of Nahima. And these are more mild. These are um, not as severe. Lilith is the more extreme. Adultery, fornication, and other forms of crimes against nature. So when you see people um, that are taking part in activities uh, that are of negative sexuality, you can say that it's 
coming from their mind, the energetic principle is coming from the lower spheres. Exactly. And the thing is that these spheres of Lilith and Nahima are closely related. And their activities overlap in some cases, some ways. You can't say that they're like two cities on a map. They're psychological aspects. And as you know, everything in our psyche is very dense and intermixed and interrelated. They're expressed as two spheres so we can understand them in a general sense. But in practical terms, it becomes quite complex when we look into our own mind, the way they relate. Any other questions? I have one more question. Okay. Uh, what's the recommendation for people who already find themselves with uh, a companion? Mm-hmm. And they, uh, they could enter into matrimony. In that moment, do you recommend that they pass? They, do they have to pass through all the other stages? Or should they try to engage themselves in mm-hmm. work? That's a good question. The sacraments are described as stages because traditionally they're given at certain stages of life. Baptism when we're babies, penance, confirmation, etc. But not everyone has received those. Right. So when we find ourselves, you know, facing the discovery of this type of knowledge, then we have to start where we are. And as we've stated in the course, it isn't necessary so much to pass through the physical rituals related to the sacraments. These are really spiritual and psychological processes. The most important thing is that we take these teachings seriously and we practice them. If we're already in a relationship, a sexual relationship, we're already married. If we're transforming, transmuting the sexual energy, we're already performing baptism. If we're meditating on our ego and fighting against temptations, we're performing the sacrament of penance. If we're proving that by changing by facing lust, by facing desire in our mind, renouncing that and changing, we're passing the sacrament of confirmation. And when we're in that relationship, a marriage, and we're making it pure, extracting the purified wine from the water, we're enacting the sacrament of matrimony. So it's psychological. But do you think that someone should stop having sex with their spouse in order to, if they haven't done all these other things, they stop having sex and try to do these other things before re-engaging? It's up to the person. person. I think each person, you know, you have to analyze your situation in light of your own tiferet. You have to go from the guidance that you receive from your own noose atom in your heart. Every situation will be different. There's no golden rule. The golden rule is do not fornicate. The golden rule is follow your divine mother. She will guide you. And as the story from John shows, the Divine Mother gives instruction to Tiferet. But he has to listen. And that's us, our own human soul. And here physically, we have to learn how to listen to our Tiferet, who's our inner priest. And when we do that, then by that means we can hear the message and guidance of our Divine Mother. Then we know what to do. Those who don't have a spouse and are longing for, for somebody, do you think that the reason why they haven't, they haven't found somebody is because they haven't passed through the previous steps? It may be. We all have our own karma. And when we discover this type of teaching, when we discover Gnosis, it's because of the intervention of our own being, our own innermost. The innermost is the one that places us where we need to be to hear this teaching. And it's because he needs us to work. He needs that purified wine to develop himself. What we need to do as students when we encounter this teaching is learn to respect his will and listen to it. And this is the job of the human soul, Tiferet. The human soul is the warrior who has to serve his king. And he has to love his lady, which is Gebra, his divine soul, who represents the divine mother in that way. Tiferet needs to listen to the instructions of Chesed, the inner Buddha. The inner Buddha knows what we need. Our own innermost always knows what we need. The problem is we don't listen to that.
is true. That's a very good point. The age of matrimony, which we state physically is 18 or 21, really we have to also reach that age psychologically, to be psychologically ready for a matrimony. And this is the point I was getting at. Our being will provide us with the elements we need in order to be prepared for that. That's what the sacraments are for. When, when our being leads us to this teaching, it's because he's preparing us for a matrimony. There's no other reason. The doctrine, the secret doctrine, the knowledge of that is the knowledge of the sacrament of matrimony. Complete. When we're led to this knowledge, it's because we need to enter that sacrament, but only when the innermost determines it. That's why the innermost is the one who has already chosen our spouse. If we're single now, it's only because we have not yet heard the instruction or we have not yet earned that right to find that spouse. But that spouse is already there somewhere. So it could take a lifetime. Maybe. It might. It's up to us to earn it. We earn it by defining ourselves in the Arcanum 6. There's a, there was some advice given that I read once that said... Um, if we want to enter into a Gnostic marriage, we should live as if we're already married. This is good advice. To live as if we already have our spouse. Right? Because really, when you do enter a marriage, you need to be prepared. And you need to be prepared to see your spouse as the one aspect of your divine parents inside. To treat your spouse like your divine mother. To treat them with reverence and love. This is not easy to do. And for single, we can start preparing for that now. So to the sacrament of matrimony is the sacrament of the mother. Yeah. Right. right. And that's, yeah, the point is, like we were saying in the beginning, matrimony is the state or condition through which the Divine Mother can act. This is her sacrament. The Divine Mother is the one who oversees the wedding feast who guides the priest. And so we need that guidance to enter the sacrament. Any other questions? This is a deep topic. There's a lot to it. So the best thing for us to do is to study the books, study the scriptures, and meditate, and reflect on our own experience and try to improve ourselves in accordance with the law. Thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.